from the middle of the jungle in the Sian Can Natural Reserve in Quintana Roo, Mexico. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the GCN, GCN Show! Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by Wiggle. Coming up this week, we talk all the weird, the wonderful, and the frankly wacky things that you see whilst out riding your bike. We've also got a new record in the Trans Am, an epic update from the Tour Divide, and more GCN cakes. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that I've got a little way to go before I qualify for the Crankworx slope style in Innsbruck. <music> they learned that GCN cakes are now an actual thing. They are. Hot on the heels of last week's yellow jersey GCN cake is this one, presented to Brandon Edwards by his mum for his birthday. Yeah, oh, you know, it's it's that is sick. Happy birthday, Brandon. Hope you enjoyed your cake. We also learned this week, whilst the Netherlands has cycling infrastructure that we are all jealous of, even the Dutch aren't immune to weather. They're not. This is Wim, who appears to have given up halfway through riding through a tunnel that was submerged in about a metre of water after a thunderstorm. I used to run my bike through there pretty much every day when I lived in Eiselstein then. Did you? I did. Never with a metre of water in it. Like, fair no. play to Wim for even trying to get through it. Uh, finally this week, we learnt that you lot have seen some rather weird and wonderful things whilst you've been out riding your bikes. And so have we, in fact. Collectively, we've done hundreds of thousands of miles out on bike rides, and occasionally you are rewarded with some ultra rare and curious sights. One of the weirdest things I've seen recently, Dan, was actually you out on a bike. Ultra rare. Ultra, well, I'm only joking. I haven't seen you on a bike since GCM Mallorca in March. But this weekend when I was out on my bike, looking across the amazing poppy fields which are currently covering the Cotswolds, I couldn't help but remind myself about all the amazing sights I've seen over the years. You know, the beautiful mountain ranges, the coastlines, the wildlife, which continues to go about its daily business, despite humans having ploughed up their environment, covered it in tarmac and towns. I wish I had a 360 camera on my bike so I, had to take, so I could take the little glimpses that I'm getting back home so other people could see what I'm seeing. Yeah. For me, Birds of Prey, Dan, goes straight to the top of my list of beauty. Just this weekend, had two massive ones sweet riding. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? There's no doubt that as cyclists, we're very privileged in terms of the amount of beauty that we get to see in nature. But then there are also certain weird and wonderful things that I don't think can be classed as beautiful. I mean, some of those has evolved over time uh, through technology or just different habits in the way that I ride, where I ride and what time I ride, but they've changed nonetheless. Yeah, I know what you mean. So when I was younger, I used to ride with my local club early on a Sunday morning, either in late summer or in early winter. And we would see a lot of young people doing the walk of shame. And it's something I don't really see anymore because I don't live near a town and I don't ride early on a Sunday morning. Well, no, walk of shame people generally only have one shoe on, don't they? Yes. And they're also generally covered in some of their own bodily fluids. Yeah, something else I don't see anymore is discarded adult entertainment in ditches. You used to see it always scattered around the edges of no. towns and cities. There was a name, hedgerow porn yeah. was the name for that, wasn't it? No, you never ever see that anymore. Internet ruins everything. No. Well, I must admit, I've never ever seen a discarded iPad in incognito mode in a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about weird things that you've seen out cycling, did I ever tell you the story about that rabbit that ran through my mate Spinergy and got slightly cut but not quite dead? Yeah, I think I vaguely remember seeing it on a GCN show a while ago. I think, yeah, I think I have said it on the GCN show before. Yeah. Well, for me, generally, my misfortune to have spotted weird things is generally people doing spe things in cars that people should normally do indoors. Really? Yeah. Cue, cue uncomfortable eye contact and a quick escape made by all parties. Ah. Right, well, we've been asking you what you've seen, uh, the most weird and wonderful things out on a bike ride. You've responded in your droves over on Instagram and indeed on Twitter, so we're going to go through a few of those now. Some of them are alarming, some of them are just downright impressive. Uh, first up, this one from Wadure. On the side of a well-traveled bike path one afternoon, I saw a man taking a poo in a bush, which reminds me of a certain predicament I was in about a week ago, out riding with my son Jude in Moores Valley Country Park near the New Forest. Uh, about 10 minutes into the ride, I suddenly got that, I wouldn't say itchy feeling, but the feeling that I needed to go, and I thought, well, I'll be fine. It's only a 25 minute ride, I'll make it round. Another five minutes in, bit further. <laughs> Another five minutes in, I said, Jude, I've got to stop. So I went <laughs> running into the forest. Nobody saw me, uh, except Jude, who's probably scarred for life and now, but I had to go. Stuff. I had to go, yeah. Anyway, wow. moving on. Next up is one of the scariest ones I've ever heard of, Dan. Gardevo, over on Instagram, has written in with, I once saw a man riding a bike with a lit, disposable barbecue oh perched word. on the handlebars. Can you imagine if that went wrong? Why? 
She loves Why living dangerously. Do that? Uh, there's a bit of a theme in the next couple. This from Kirsty1507. Naked Ramblers is all Kirsty has said. Uh, whilst Max the Ferg said, I saw a naked man riding a Honda CRF 450 doing wheelies. Very specific on the model of motorcycle. I'm surprised yeah. he even noticed that with a naked man on top of it. Uh, meanwhile, Chris A on Twitter sent us this photo of something that he saw out riding his bike. Uh, an upturned light aircraft in a field with a man on a motorised lawnmower. Well, they're all, all motorised, like a sit-on lawnmower, looking at it. Wow. Common Sense 101 used his common sense when he saw this sign in South Africa, the Karoo. It reads, climb over this fence and you're dead. You obviously didn't cross that sign. Well, you? I don't think I'd be crossing that sign. That'd be a risky business once you'd read that, wouldn't it? It would. Uh, this is from Barry Kuz. The weirdest thing that he's seen out on a bike ride is people using $8 tires on a $3,000 bike. Ooh. Next up is one of my favourites. Rich and Gareth from Braunton, North Devon saw this. Persia 106 with two sheep in the back. They've included a nice little picture there. Oh my goodness. Mm. That's your neck of the woods, isn't it? Next it, door. It is, but you would never catch me driving like that. Oh my word. I was going to say, you've probably never seen anything like that because it was you in the driver's seats. You. Uh, Mark Hagen, for, I did a bike packing trip in North Vietnam and saw a six year old boy riding an ox down a mountain. It's a sport over there, mountain oxing. Not something you see every day though. Well, it is Maybe. over there. <laughs> yeah. uh, then we have Kevin S over on Twitter. Beware jerks who dump pets. Pets for coyotes, for coyote baits. Karma will get you. There you go. Buy me. He said, I should also note that the Strava segment for this stretch of road is called Coyote Drop Off. Brilliant. Uh, Emili said, I once saw an Audi driver use an indicator. Boom. Yeah. I've got 28 likes on Twitter, that did. That's good, that actually. A car, uh, a shy poster, sorry. A car once gave us one and a half meters clearance when passing. Wow, uh, they're getting slightly sarcastic now, aren't they? Uh, uh, Al Hewton put a chicken stood on a cow's back. Nothing else in the field, one chicken, one cow, that's it. That is slightly weird, isn't that it? But nice that they're close that. together. Uh, Duggars, over on Instagram again, someone reading a book on an iPad whilst riding. Skillful, multitasking. But weird. Normally people reserve that for driving, that sort of activity. Well, yeah, true. Uh, and finally, Chasing Mice put, I've been chased by elephants cycling in Sri Lanka. Very scary moments, very surreal too. I Serves you right for chasing mice in the first place, Chasing Mice. Yeah. Uh, As ever, I'm sure we've only scratched the surface of the weird things that you've seen out on your bikes. If you do have a story that you want to tell us about, drop it in the comments below and we're going to read out a few of the best ones next week. Yeah, try and keep it clean. I bet there's going to be some good ones, actually. Uh, but before we finish with weird things and cycling, here's Cy. Ah, I see you tried to do that, Lloydie, but I'm not actually cycling right now. Uh, following off from that point, actually, about being chased by elephants, I learned yesterday that of all the predators in Idaho, mountain lions, black bears, actually the thing that I need to be scared of most is moose, which can be highly aggressive and are also enormous. So uh, anyway, there we go, that was news to me. Uh, right, whilst here in the wilderness, I thought it was an opportune moment to talk about the Tour Divide, which is that epic bike packing race that goes off-road from Canada right down through the US, the length of the Rockies to the Mexican border. And a friend of GCN and our kind of bike packing guru, Josh Ibert, is currently out there in the field and has sent us a couple of updates. So the uh, Great Brush Mountain Lodge Armistice is finished. Basically, a load of us got kind of stuck. Loads of trees, loads of snow on one top of the pass here. And uh, yeah, we just uh, we got stuck there for 48 hours. And, well, I did anyway. A guy, load of guys came after us, and then there's a real struggle mentally because you kind of you finish, you shut down, and then uh, it's hard to get going, and your body starts shutting down. But all the guys who came 24 hours after us, they still had a bit of fire in them, and they left early this morning at 3 a.m. And I got up, and no one was there. I was like. It's got to finish this, so. so here I am. Conditions undeniably absolutely grim. Take a look at this photo of Josh's bike. No surprise that he and Lael turned around. Also, the runaway leader had actually managed to get lost in a snowstorm up there. He also had to turn back and then has subsequently pulled out of the race, probably hampered it in no small part due to the fact he'd only had three hours sleep in eight days. Now, it looks like all those riders that had been held up at Brush Mountain Lodge have now made it over the pass, but they're some way behind the four leaders that had made it through before that storm hit. A storm which I'm told is the worst summer storm to hit Colorado in 30 years. Anyway, current leader on the road is Chris Seistrup. He's got less than 1,800 miles to go. I thoroughly suggest you check in with dotwatchers.cc to get your updates, because uh, it's strangely fascinating. 
Thank you very much, Si. Uh, we've actually got our own new kit to show you right now, though. Yes, we have, Dan, the new GCM fan kit, available for pre-order over at the shop, shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Yep, they've proven very popular over the last few months, have the GCM fan kits. Uh, this one is available in both men's and women's fit, so as Chris said, it's available for pre-order now. So if you head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com, you can do that pre-order right over there. I'm a fan of this fan kit, actually. Next up, it's a weekly GCN Inspiration competition. A reminder of how you enter this. Uh, you either need to use the hashtag GCN Inspiration on Instagram, or you just use the uploader. There's a link to that in the description below. Well worth doing and submitting your photos because there are three prizes on offer each and every week. 50 pounds for third place, 75 for second, and 100 pounds if you win the top prize to spend on anything you want over at the Wiggle online shop. And also, I quite like going through all the pictures. You always use the hashtag GCN Inspiration, don't you? I, try. I think it's for more followers it. though, isn't it? No, it's for more likes, Dan. Is, it? is that what it is? <laughs> right, in third place then? In third place, we have Eduardo, who's from Stradali, Catania, but he's on the Empire Pass in Utah. Just on a normal training ride after riding up Empire Pass. 10 kilometers, 10% average gradient. Look wow. at that. I wonder how many takes that took him to get the right photo. He's done well though, I like that. Yeah, so well done to you. 50 pounds for third place. But in second this week, it is Juan uh, with this picture that came in from Sumner over in New Zealand. He said, I didn't know why there were no cyclists that day. It happened to be that it was the official coldest day of the year. Uh, the beach reminded me of summer though. That is beautiful and actually reminds me of some riding that I used to do over the Purbex in Swanage area. Doesn't mm. look dissimilar. That looks lovely. Right, shall we drum roll first? Shall we? Ba -da -da -ba -ba -ba. Marcus over in Finland, surrounded by green trees on what looks to be a purpose built gravel path. I bikes. do love that photo. Yeah. It does look like a purpose built gravel bike path, doesn't it? And uh, well, if you can use that for your commute to work and back, that's absolutely brilliant. I've no idea where it is though, so it might not be a commute at all, but I'd love to ride it either way. Don't forget to get involved ready for next week for your chance to win one of the three prizes. It's now time for cycling shorts. Cycling shorts now, and we're gonna start with news that Giant Bicycles chairwoman Bonnie Tu says that days could be numbered for bicycles produced in China. The reason for this are Donald Trump's newly imposed import tariffs that have come about through the trade dispute between the USA and China, which basically are going to mean it's not really cost effective to make bikes in China anymore. Uh, two says that on average, a giant bicycle that's imported into the USA will have an extra tariff of $100, which is a lot. Instead, manufacturing giants, such as Giant, are going to be building factories closer to their markets. So in Hungary, for example, for the European market. Mm, which is all right for them because they're big enough that they can afford to do it. I mean, they've got to please the shareholders, they've got to ultimately maximise their profits again, and they will do that. But you'd imagine that for smaller businesses that have their bikes produced in China, this could pose a big problem and really negatively affect their businesses. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see it, it pans out. Moving on down, the greatest athlete you've never heard of? Possibly. This week I found a really interesting article about Oscar Svensson, a physically gifted youngster who has raised the bar for what is thought to be the edge of human performance. It was really interesting. You sent it over to me. It's on Outside Online magazine if you'd like to check it out yourself. Uh, they basically detailed a lot of his laboratory testing over a period of time. Uh, laboratory testing which ultimately culminated in that record-breaking and frankly astounding VO2 max test where he recorded 96.7 uh, millilitres per kilogram body weight per minute. Yeah, but ultimately, despite being able to process 7.397 litres of oxygen per minute, it wasn't enough to overcome the other aspects of cycling where he lacked a little. So the technical side of things, which he openly said was an issue, the tactical side of things, and then you've got the cumulative fatigue of all of these short, intense efforts built up over a long season of racing. Mm -hmm. And the point of the story is? The point of the story is cycling is by no means a one-dimensional sport. And no matter how fit you are, there's always another aspect that you can be focusing on. And if you're not that fit, you can probably overcome that deficit by focusing on those other aspects anyway. Good point to the story, Chris. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna move over to the ultra endurance world now and give you a story about a new record in the Trans Am. Congratulations, Abdullah Zainab, who went through what must have been an agonizing 16 days, nine hours, and 56 minutes to complete the 4,200 mile course, uh, which meant that he averaged over 250 miles per day. And also a massive congratulations to the winner of the women's event, Leah Metzorogova. Uh, she completed that distance in just under 21 and a half days, which actually was good enough to give her a top 10 placing overall. Ninth, I would personally say in fact, because there was a tandem pairing in fifth. That's good going that. Also finishing last week was the race across America, which was won by Christoph Strasser for a sixth time out of the last nine years. Some way off his record, but still over half a day ahead of the next best rider. 
What a legend. He's an absolute legend. He must know America well as well by now, Christos what, Strasser. One road anyway. Well, that's true. I presume it's the same road every year, is it? I was guessing it would be. <laughs> uh, also, at the time of filming, the Racing Collective GB Duro event is taking place, and currently, it is Lachlan Morton of EF Education First who is leading the way. Blimey. The event is a 2,000 kilometer self-supported four-stage event with over 30,000 meters of climbing across all terrains and surfaces the UK has to offer. Properly ultra endurance then. Properly. You know, I was looking at pro cycling stats earlier, and I see that Lachlan, uh, in his normal job, has done 30 days of pro racing, which has accumulated him 4,391 kilometers. So in effect, this event is going to add about 50% of uh, distance to his racing kilometers this oh, year. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. He's gonna have quite a wait for the after party though, isn't he? He is, yeah, that's on July the 2nd, isn't it, in yeah. John O'Groats. Presumably he'll have to fly back for it, because he's gonna be finished way before then. Yeah, he is, at this rate. Yeah. Anyway, in other news, the UCI this week has announced reforms to its UCI track calendar. They have, and it hasn't gone down well with everybody, no. has it? Uh, amongst those reforms are the fact that the prestigious UCI World Cup is set to disappear, or at least be renamed to the UCI Nations Cup, and as the name suggests, that means it's only open to national track teams. And then consider that the series is now gonna be over three rounds, rather than the six that we were accustomed to with the World Cup. That's gonna take place just between July and September, followed closely by the World Champs, which moves from March over to October. Mm. Those are the confirmed changes, but they also did say that they'll be launching a brand new series which will take place over the winter months, which is gonna be new and innovative and brilliant for the TV spectator, although no further details were in that press release, so we'll wait and see what that's all about. Uh, the fact, though, that it's national teams only at the World Cup is going to have a hugely negative effect on trade teams, though, such as the Beats team from the Netherlands and the Hoob Watt Bike team here from Derby. Yeah, Hoob Watt Bike, who were understandably quite upset at this announcement, have actually written an open letter to the UCI. And personally, I think it's a real shame that we're not going to get to see these underdogs challenging the more established national teams going forward, because they have been one of the biggest stories in track cycling in recent years. Well, yeah, they have, yeah, there's no doubt about that. Now, the real reason for coming out to Idaho wasn't actually to learn about moose, but instead to check out some of the amazing tech that's been on display here at Outer Bike. Perhaps causing the biggest stir of all was this new wheel set from Hunt called the 48 Limitless. Now, they've been doing a whole load of wind tunnel testing, and they say that these are the fastest mid-depth wheel set in the world which is a really big claim and even bigger when you factor in the price because they've kept it really low for this carbon wheel set, particularly when you take into consideration they've got a nice touch of some ceramic speed bearings in there. Now, I guess the question is, how are they so aero? And the answer seems to be that they are wide, like super wide, 34.5 millimeters wide, in fact. And the reason a wide rim can be more aero is because you need to factor in the tire pretty essential part of any wheel set, but it's really important when designing the shape of the rim because the two have to work together in tandem, of course. So when you have a rim that is wider than the tire, the overall shape that it creates can be much closer to that of a true aerofoil, therefore minimizing turbulence on both the leading and trailing edges of the rim. However, wider isn't just automatically better, it does bring with it a couple of problems. You either have to have a super wide rim bread on there, meaning that you would struggle to safely run standard width road tires, or you have a normal width rim bed on there, but then you have a load of additional mass because the carbon sidewalls have to be so thick. And it's here that Hunt have come up with a really cool trick, one they're actually patenting. So they've chosen a rim bed width of 22.5 millimeters, which will work with 25 mil tires and it's optimized for 28. And then to offset the additional weight that that might create, they have basically engineered a recess into the carbon fiber and what would be your braking surface. And then they filled it with a low density polymer before curing the whole thing together. And that low density polymer is actually half the weight of the carbon fiber that it replaces. I mean, they save 50 grams per rim. The whole thing comes in at 1,582 grams for the pair. And you've got to remember that this technology wouldn't be able to happen were it not for the fact that these are disc specific wheels. It's allowed them to be both wide and tailor the shape of the rim side walls and furthermore, replace some of that carbon with that low density polymer. The other thing to mention is these are tubeless specific wheels. And as you'll know, there's all that research out there at the minute showing that tubeless tires can be the lowest rolling resistance tires out there. So all in all, they sound like a fairly speedy pair of wheels. 
been a little while since we had a giveaway, but we've got a massive one for you this week. Uh, this is an opportunity for two people to go and ride part of the final stage of the Tour de France this year, courtesy of Les Cadets Junior. Uh, some of you will remember that actually because Emma went to cover this very thing for us last year. Entrants must be between 15 and 18 years of age, and if you live in Europe, your travel costs will be covered. Unfortunately though, sorry, if you don't live in Europe, you have to pay your own way there. You have to make your own way there, yeah. Uh, either way, all accommodation is going to be paid for. As I said though, a huge opportunity because those two lucky winners will get to ride part of that last day, which of course goes into the Champs-Élysées, the famous Champs-Élysées, on Sunday the 28th of July. Yep, you'll need to supply your own bike, but Continental will provide you with riding kit and tires. So all in all, it's well worth entering, I would say. Yep, and you can find out how to enter in the description just below this video. I mean, make sure you do it, because how cool would it be? Well, firstly, to be between 15 and 18 years yeah. old still, and uh, now 20 years beyond that. But secondly, to ride part of that final stage, it's what all cyclists dream of, isn't it? Yep, that'd be amazing. I'm gonna be there, actually, for Eurosport, so I'll cheer you in if you win. Hack. Forward slash bodge coming up for you right now, and we're gonna start off with a monumental hack. Uh, this masterpiece has come into us from Chet Langford, and I can tell you firsthand, he's been working on this for months because he's been messaging me over on Instagram with updates to this build. Ah, that's why you're calling it a hack before you've even changed well, the Well, yes, uh, this is a live bike that he's made and customized for his girlfriend, Jennifer Phillips, and I think you'll agree, the results on this one are quite spectacular. That pink chain even glows in the dark. You can't argue with that, Dan, that is a hack. That looks. That looks yeah. out of this world. Well done, chat. All of that time you put into it was well worth it. Next up is a hack from Annex Hack, self-professed. Australia, Ad Adelaide. Magpies keep swooping at me in the swooping season. I had to Google what this was. So he did a bit of research and found that magpies don't like bling objects. So he put fake diamonds on his helmet and he hasn't had a magpie swoop at him since. Wow. They, these animals are vicious. Maybe he's found a solution to a genuine problem because we often get people from Australia and New Zealand telling us about swooping season and it sounds horrific. In fact, we've seen videos before, yeah. haven't we? It's they brutal. attack you like nobody's business. All right, on to this one from Dan. I was sick of my kids just dropping their bikes in the middle of the garage floor, so I built a mini bike rack for them out of some leftover bits of wood from another project. Hack, easily. Look at that. Anything that keeps your bikes neatly stored is a hack from me. Yeah. He's done a good job there. Anything made with wood looks stunning, always. Yeah, three hacks from three so far. Right about then. this one from Tim? Tim up next, Indre Eloir. My terrible French pronunciation, sorry. Switching from toe straps to NTB cleats, he just started getting pains in his right knee. A broken leg in his teens left him with his right foot twisted outwards, so he's made an aluminium wedge to fit under the cleat to incline his foot and have less no, he's had no knee pain since, sorry. Well, if that's worked, that's another hack. Yep. Four from four so far. I'm sure there's a bodge somewhere this week. Surge up next. A friend of his found a way to carry her banana while adding minimal weight using self-adhesive gauze. Didn't work that well though, apparently. 40 kilometers later, the banana was quite bruised. We don't even have to touch a banana for it to be bruised. Just no. put it in the driver's side, in the passenger seat next to you go on an hour's journey. Yeah. It's all bruised by the end of it, don't know Great why. for making banana bread. Uh, and finally, a correction from last week. I was in the bad books with Louis Lemousse about this, which I proclaimed was a bodge. Uh, apparently, the cranks there are not to turn the spit, but rather to raise the grill. Now, that's pretty smart. So I'm gonna make sure it's deemed a hack. Okay, Sorry. and the previous one, the banana, that's a bodge. Yeah, definitely bodge. Caption competition time now. Your weekly chance, of course, to get yourself a GCN Camelback water bottle. All you've got to do is put your best caption underneath the photo in the comment section below. Last week's photo was this one. Uh, this is, of course, Victor Campenarts on the podium at the Tour of Belgium with a large keg of beer above his head. We've got a winner, but we've got a token mention to start with. With the caption. This time, I'm going for Lloydie's Hour Record. Good one now. Not quite good enough to win, though. No, the winner this week is Matthias Tang with, can someone please hand me the barrel adjuster? Very, very clever. Yeah, we had some really good ones underneath last week's show. Uh, get in touch with us with a message on Facebook, Matthias, and we'll get that bottle out to you as soon as we possibly can. This week's photo was also, in fact, from the Criterium du Dauphiné. It's Wout Pauls, also on the podium of that race. Uh, I'm gonna get you started. When it rains, it pulls. Oh, Dan. I was really happy with that. Oh, Can't believe you got your head in your hand. <laughs> Didn't that was good? All right, well, if you can do better, please leave your captions in the comment section down below. It's time now for a brand new segment here on the GCN Show, which is one actually that we've carried over from Ask GC Anything, which is taking a break on Fridays for the next few months for some new content that's up and coming. Uh, it's basically your opportunity to ask us a training-related question, which you will get answered, but also to win yourself three months free subscription to Zwift. 
Yep, all you need to do is use the hashtag AskGCNTraining down in the comments below or over on Twitter or even Instagram and we will find your question, send it off to the coaches at Zwift and answer them. First up though, this week's winner is Mark Jones who writes in with the following question. I'm heading to Belgium in the summer to take on some cobbled climbs. Can you recommend any good sessions to prepare for the unique flandering conditions? Well, before we recommend the sessions, first up, Mark, you are going to absolutely love the bike riding in Belgium. I mean, admittedly, it's not as exotic as heading to the Dolomites or the Alps no. or the Pyrenees, but the advantage is that you get to ride some of the most famous climbs and roads in the world of cycling in quite a short period of time. Yeah. Plus, Belgian beer. Yeah, I thought you might say that. Honestly though, you cannot believe how close most of these roads are together. So to get onto the training, despite whatever level of fitness you may have, the one unique feature of the Flandrian climbs is actually they are relatively short. So you're looking at efforts of under five minutes in duration. So you're gonna to want to do some repeated efforts. Yeah, we've got a couple of sessions planned yeah. for you actually. One of them is very structured. Uh, so what you do is get a good warm up in and then do six to eight repeats on a climb if you've got one near you of four minutes each in duration. For those four minutes, you want to try and ride at 120% of your FTP, or if you're going on feel, it's pretty a nine to nine and a half out of 10 yeah. effort level, isn't it? Alternatively, if you don't want that level of structure, what you can do is go out, find a few climbs on a loop near you, maybe two to three in the same lap, just do three laps where you go out and go hard on the climbs and easy in between, making sure that they're reasonably short, less than yeah. five minutes each. If it is flat where you live, you could always do this by slightly over gearing yourself and doing these efforts on the flat, similar duration again. Now, there's one thing to think about. Actually, no, you, first off, you could do a couple of these sessions a week within your normal training. And then whilst you're doing these sessions, it's actually quite important to remain seated because these climbs with the cobbles and the bouncing around, it's actually quite hard to maintain traction at the rear True. wheel. So to ensure, especially when it's wet, so to ensure that you don't have any issues with that, if you prepare yourself before going out to remain seated for the entirety of those efforts, you'll be in a much better place to tackle those climbs. Yeah, you'll find it much easier. Uh, let us know how you get on, Mark, and for the rest of you, don't forget to keep your training questions coming in with the hashtag AskGCNTraining. Uh, you can leave that in the comment section below or indeed over on Twitter. We have, as ever, picked out three of our favorite comments from the previous seven days of GCN videos. Uh, first up, it's this from Mr. Anderson. Uh, this was below the video about how to look behind you when you're cycling. He says, the sad thing is, when Dan learned how to look behind him safely, all he could do was see the broom wagon. Uh, that's you a conundrum, one, man. Didn't you? Yeah, I did. Do you, do you jump in the broom wagon or do you carry on riding? Shame, full of shame. I don't know if I ever went in a broom wagon. I did, Maybe many times. once. Underneath Ask GC Anything, my wife is a half wheeler, but in walking, thinks she just walks faster than me, but she's just half legging. Now I know the term. Thanks, guys. Half legging. Never heard that one before. Uh, meanwhile, underneath last week's GCN show, uh, Joanne put, Dan is an above average presenter. Oh, that's nice. I stumbled on that though, so I'm not great, as, a, as that comment points out. You are out. above average. This is after me requesting uh, a comment that said I was a good presenter. There were a few people that said Dan's a brilliant presenter, but yeah. not that many. Right. Most people put above average or below. Some people put Dan is a presenter, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of sorts. Uh, right, on to what's coming up on the channel over the next seven days. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to give you some hacks for riding in the rain, which would have been yep. useful here in the UK for the previous eight weeks or so, which have been pretty torrential. Uh, on Thursday, we're going to bust five pro cycling myths and on Friday Sai is going to bring you an epic ride from where he is at the moment in Idaho. Saturday we're comparing cyclists with footballers that's me against a professional footballer. Sunday we follow James McDonald as he attempts to ride more than 900 kilometers in 24 hours and that is an absolute epic which James or Hank as we know him went over to see at the velodrome that's going to be absolutely incredible. Monday is the racing news show and then Tuesday is back with the GCN show episode 338. Uh, right, that is all for this week, but if you would like to see what Hank and Ollie were up to over in Poland last week, you can find that video from the weekend uh, just down here.